great setup. I love that song. I really do. I really do. We continue our series on faith. And today we want to talk about the faithful feet. The faithful feet. Um, this is a very exciting series that we're on. Because every time we hear about faith, guess what happens to our faith? It grows. It grows. By the time we're done with this series, we'll be flying in the air. <laughs> we'll be so faithful. Yeah. Everything is possible, right? Nothing shall be impossible for those that believe. Now, the message tonight is going to be by our brother Tobias. Come on up. Okay. Actually, kind of a minor miracle that I'm even standing here in front of you tonight. I'll no, get into that in a sec. Um, it's been an interesting week. I started studying for this message um, well a couple weeks ago, and um, the thought in the the um, just those words, the faithful few, really resonated with me right away. Um, and so I was really excited about this. And then you get into the word sometimes, and then you start going like this, and it's like, wow, so I'm going this way and then that way, and I realized that um, I was trying to pull forward a message that wasn't of the Spirit, um, and it wasn't God's message, and so in my uh, my reading, my outline got to be about nine pages long, <laughs> and I realized there's no way this is going to work, and so um, tonight's message I'm excited to hear, because I don't know what it's going to be as I stand up here. I'm just going to go with it and, um, and let the Spirit speak, because I think I've done the work mm -hmm. to get in the way of what he wanted to say from the beginning, and so I'm going to get out of the way and, uh, and let, him take the, uh, let him take the altar, if you will. Um, so this week for me has been really uh, interesting. This is my last week at my old job, um, and I'm dealing with some interesting things with that, a lot of work. Um, uh, studying for tonight, but also I got really sick. I've been sick for a month, and um, on it's Wednesday. On Monday, I started getting this. I knew it was coming back really, really, really hardcore, and um, so I coughed my way through Monday night into Tuesday. And Tuesday, when I woke up, it was just ugh, and everything is just awful. And so I started thinking that day, like, when do I need to call Olu about this? Because I know that when I call Olu, there's going to be healing, and is it going to be better for the group if I call on Wednesday and like somehow I'm standing in front of them and then the stuff just dries up, or what do I do? You know. And so, um, but really, no. So I, I mean, I was thinking that. What would, what, what? And I prayed on it, and and so I called Olu last night, and um, uh, and he prayed over me, and um, it was pretty amazing. I mean, I felt better right away, but when I went to bed, I started praying right before I went to sleep. Um, number one, I knew that I needed to take my hand off this, and so I did that. Um, and as I laid down, um, I started to pray about, Lord, please make sure that can I, I'm not going to be able to talk tomorrow, because I couldn't talk yesterday. And I literally felt, I think the only way I can describe it is like um, someone dropping a blanket and it just filtering. There was just this feeling, and out of nowhere, all that stuff went away. Like, I'm not kidding. It's before I was even done with my prayer, it just went... And so I'm back here singing. I was thinking that, like, you know, not believe I'm singing. And, like, if you heard me, it was awful. And so, and then today, it's just, it's gone. So, yeah, it's amazing. So if you believe in it and say, when do we want this to happen? Because you know it's going to happen. My gosh. Like, obviously, I don't know. Like, that's in God's hands and his time. So at any rate, um, glory be to, the, to God for that. So, the faithful few, when we first started tonight, there were just a few of us here, so I was like, this is kind of funny, it'll be perfect. Um, and I'm glad that there's more of you have shown up. Um, uh, I really wanted to, um, to kind of, to, to, to basically respect where we're at in the year right now, um, tonight, and, and recognize that, well, we're just coming beyond Christmas. Um, and yeah, that means that Christmas is over, but I don't think that Christmas is meant to be over any day of the year. That every day of the year is Christmas to us because we're living in His blessing. We're living in His birth. Obviously, uh, His death for us is quite important, but the fact that He came down to us is a blessing every day. Um, so I started thinking about this and praying on it, and, um, and Olu had given me a little bit of a prod, but I was led to the book of Malachi. Um, 
And I had never really, I, I hadn't, I've read Malachi at some point, I can't tell you when. Um, and uh, the more I started looking into this, it just made perfect sense. And the book of Malachi is the last book in the Old Testament. The book of Matthew is the first book in the New Testament. And the book of Malachi is a book of prophecy. Um, it speaks about Jesus' coming in a small portion. It speaks about judgment. It speaks about some of the things that God really holds uh, important in terms of what are sins and what are things that we need to be cognizant of while we're down here because these are things that he said are important to him. Um, and then there is a lot of prophecy in it that actually is very evident comes quite true through the New Testament. So, um, in looking at this and, and realizing that, wow, this is Malachi, and this is 430 years before Jesus' birth, that we need to really kind of think about this. And I did as I was studying that, well, you got a book that was written 430 years before Jesus, and it prophesizes his birth. It is the last book in the Old Testament to open our way into the New Testament and the good word. And a lot of what it talks about comes true. It's pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing. And so if you've done some studying in the, um, in the Old Testament, you know that there are, there are, uh, are roughly it's 12 minor prophets. Um, I might be wrong in the number. but And I thought the minor prophet means they weren't that important, and that's not quite true. <laughs> the minor prophets are prophets that don't have a large book, essentially, where their prophecy comes through, where it be dated. And, um, these are smaller books that are... They are literally, these are oracles, they're individuals who typically came down and they were just pure prophets. The name Malachi means uh, my messenger. And that's all we know about Malachi, his name, literally. Where was he born? No one knows. No one knows anything about Malachi other than his name was my messenger. And he brought this word to us. So pretty, pretty interesting in that. And there's other books like that in the Bible as well, but Malachi stands out that, you know, this is somebody whose sole purpose was to bring a word from God. That's why he was here. So we get into a little bit. I, I, I want to do some background here um, because uh, just so before I jump in, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fast forward through chapter, a couple chapters in Malachi because at the beginning I'll tell you what was going on and the meat of it is in the middle. Um, but Malachi, the Jews call this the seal of prophecy, um, is the term that they use for the book of Malachi, because they do believe that all of the prophets who came forward were absolute prophets in the Old Testament, where of course there's debate from the Jewish standpoint of the New Testament, but they, everyone is in agreement that this is the last prophetic word that was to come out um, of the Old Testament, and so it's called the seal of prophecy. Um, basically what was happening at this time is not unusual, as you've read through the Old Testament. God's people had kind of uh, walked astray and were not being faithful and appreciating all that God had done for them and they were becoming um, very uh, complacent in their lives. And uh, basically what we have here is we have a situation where um, you have the Israelites who are at a point now where they've said, look, we've been wandering around, yeah, you've delivered us from Egypt and, and Babylon, and you've done all these things for us, but where is this, where, where are you gonna come down and glorify yourself and glorify us as a Jewish people in front of all nations? At this time, uh, the, the, the Jewish nation was still a very small piece of land in all of the, um, all of uh, the Persian Empire at this point. So they're, they're still 430 years before Christ saying, oh, okay, we haven't been given enough, this isn't enough. When are you gonna come down and do all these miraculous things? So what do they do? You got Moses, when Moses went up with the burning bush and you hear from God, he leaves his people and what do they do? They build an altar, uh, sorry, they build an idol, a golden calf, and they start worshiping it. Like, crazy, who does that, right? So here, it's a little less extreme, but kind of the same thing. What you have happening are, at this point, the, the, the Jewish um, hierarchy, there was a system of how they lived their lives. And part of it was you had these people that are called the Levites, and, or Levites. So I'm going to get that wrong the entire time I talk. The Levites were charged with a couple things. Um, they're priests. The Levite priests, which were the kind of the highest of the Levites, the most holy of the holy, they're from the, the lineage of Aaron. Um, 
the holy of the holiest um, would offer the sacrifices to, um, to God. So their job, job was basically to watch over the tents, to watch over the temple, and to offer sacrifices. So they had a pretty interesting relationship with the Lord in that sense. Um, the Levites also were not promised any land. It's very interesting. All of the other tribes of Israel were promised land. The Israel or the Levites were not promised land. And I'll give you and tell you what they're promised, but they were given a very specific kind of job and duty. So at this time, what they were doing is the Levites, not only were they supposed to offer the, the, the sacrifices, but they were also supposed to be teaching. And they were supposed to be kind of the pastors. Well, they weren't leading their people very well. And they'd lost faith. Um, and at this point, not only were they taking, uh, they were taking sacrifices that were uh, unfit for the Lord, based on the Old Testament and the law, they were taking uh, animals that were wounded, they were taking basically scraps and then offering them to God. So they were saying, here God, this is enough, this, you know, at this point I guess I've fulfilled my duties, um, which is abhorred in itself. Uh, at the same time, you had people um, in, their, in their tribe and in, in the nation, um, some of the Jewish men were going off and they were marrying uh, pagan women, women who worship pagan gods. And um, this is really the first time we see this in the Old Testament. And so that was something that God kind of, you know, you'll hear rumbles about as well. Uh, divorces were happening. And that wasn't something that happens in the Old Testament too often. And what was happening was you had these people that are going off and they're marrying people, individuals who are not equally yoked <laughs> from different religions, and it wasn't meshing at all. And so the guy saying, you know what, yeah, you, you were hot, but now I don't want to have anything to do with you because we don't speak the same language on anything in our life, so I'm going to divorce you. Um, that was a big problem. So you had all these issues that are going on in the tribe of Israel, the, the faithful people that we've seen kind of come up uh, in other stories. And so what happens is um, there wasn't a big plague. There wasn't a huge uh, storm. You had an oracle come. And that oracle was Malachi. So the first two books of Malachi are just that. It's basically him saying, look, you're doing this, and these things are not pure, and they're not of God. And these are things that God, you've got a job, and your whole job was just to do this, and you aren't even sticking, you, how, you know, what is wrong with you, essentially, is what he's saying. So, um, through the first two chapters, again, and I apologize, I'm going to have to check my notes often because tonight, um, I haven't had a lot of chance to look at these, even though I spent a lot of time studying. But if we could start, let's go into chapter 3 is where this actually starts getting good. So you have this background, that's the background, that's what's going on. And in chapter three, um, Malachi starts talking about what is gonna happen, and this is really the prophecy. Before is admonishment, and chapter three starts uh, with the prophecy. Could someone please read for me Malachi 3.1? Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. Interesting. So he says that there is somebody, <laughs> I think we've heard this before, um, but this is the Old Testament, last book of the Bible, last book of the Old Testament, right before the New Testament. And you have someone saying, behold, there be a messenger, that he's going to come before God, he's going to come before me, the Lord Almighty. And the messenger is going to lay the way for me. Um, and uh, to me, I just, I read that and I kind of laughed to myself because we've heard this and, and we'll get into it. Obviously, I know we're talking about John the Baptist, but it's, keep in mind the date and time. Uh, it's, to me, amazing. The more we think about this, that, wow, this is 430 years before events that happened at a time that kicked off the next time that the Bible basically started again. So um, if we can move on to, someone please read Malachi 3, 2 through 4. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can, en and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer to the Lord and an offering in righteousness. Mm. So, um, 
It's very interesting. So number one, we have we have Malachi saying that the Lord's going to come. There's going to be a messenger, and then God's going to come. But what is God going to do? It doesn't say that God's going to come down and raise your nation in front of everybody else, and you're going to be a blessed nation, and, we're, and it's going to be a huge celebration. He says that God's going to come down and cast judgment on you and put you through the fire. Mm. Like, <laughs> it's a... Uh, Wow, I, 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 you know, at that time, I think if people were really listening to what he's saying, that would be a real eye opener. And um, I don't think it worked at the time. But he's saying, and prophetically, we see this throughout the Old Testament a lot. There's a lot of references to the refiner's fire. And um, I wanted to talk about that for a second because I think that as we go through this, you're going to see that this is something that has been promised for us as Christians that. Number one, yeah, we, we, God's coming. But when he comes, he's coming for a specific reason. And that specific reason is to glorify himself and to bring a new world and a new earth to us. Um, but before that, something's got to happen. So you hear a lot about the refiner's fire throughout the, the scripture. You hear a lot about the shaking. Olu talked about the great shaking. And the shaking is actually... Um, you'll see that in Job and Matthew and Hebrews. It's, it's really the concept is, it's pretty cool. It's that if you have, there are a lot of loose particles on something, you're going to shake it and whatever is part of the whole is going to stay on. Those things that aren't part of it are going to fall off. Same thing with the refiner's fire. They talk about gold and you talk about silver. And what's this process? So I look into it. And, uh, so you need about 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit to start refining silver and gold, right? So they take a piece of ore and they throw it in. And I didn't know this, but usually silver and gold are kind of, they grow together, like they form together. So you need to get it to that temperature to have the gold and silver actually separate themselves from each other. But you need this extreme temperature, right? Um, I think it's important to note that uh, a couple of things here. Okay. First off, like we have treasure, and treasure's a good thing, right? Um, we talk about gold and silver, and, and they're referring to these things as treasure. Um, you see a lot of references to treasure and gold and silver in the Bible, but you don't see a lot of references to things like uh, dust and mold. Mm -hmm. So these are obviously important things, and these are things that God's saying, like these are, you know, these are things that are worth value. So, the fact that we're talking about treasures here in gold and silver is important, number one. Um, number two, as we mentioned before, were the Levites. Um, there's a special place for, for the Levites in this, pas in this passage, and there's a special place for the Levites today, where we're at. Um, and, but just to give you another little glimpse about what the Levites were given, could someone please turn and read to us Deuteronomy 18, 1 through 2? Deuteronomy 18, 1 and 2. The priests who are Levites, indeed the whole tribe of Levi, are to have no allotment or inheritance with Israel. They shall live with the offerings made to the Lord by fire, for that is their inheritance. They shall have no inheritance among their brothers. The Lord is their inheritance as he promised them. Mm. Okay, thank you. So the Levites were not only given a special job, but God said that your reward will be me. So the Levites out of the 12 tribes were the one tribe that was given basically God saying, I'm promising you that I will be with you, that you have me as your, uh, your reward. So it's not land that they're looking for. They're supposed to have their mind and their heart set on God because God's promised them himself. It's a pretty special reward. Um, and very unique to that one tribe as well. Um, so, you've got Malachi talking about this. He says, God's coming, and there's going to be judgment. And here's all these things that are going on right now. And I think that it's very interesting when you're talking about prophecy, and, pro and, the, and, the, and the, um, the prophesizer actually speaks about specific sins or things that are going wrong. And... Um, there's a couple here, and I'll go through them briefly in Malachi 3 through 5. Um, so you got Malachi, and they say it's his warning against judgments for certain types of sins. Um, number one is sorcerers. And uh, sorcerers really are, I, I'm sure they're prevalent today, um, but back, 
around this time, there were quite a few sorcerers. A lot of people would deal in trying to have evil spirits help them uh, achieve their goals. And that's really what sorcery is. Let's, let's have evil spirits help us to achieve something in our life. Um, and this was pretty prevalent at the time. So it's either you were with God, or you were agnostic, or a lot of people, um, technically, if you were trying to, uh, if you were praying to a pagan god, it could be considered sorcery as well, because it wasn't God himself, it was something else that you were trying to have help you with your life. Um, adulterers, interestingly, that's any form of lust. Like, the, the term adultery, I always think of, all right, well, you know, don't cheat on your husband or wife. The Bible, when you read it and you get into the, the actual meaning, it's lustfulness. So that you, whenever you hear that word, I think in the future, think that. That when, when, when we hear that, you're, you know, that's, that's one of the, the major, oh, adultery, do not murder, do not commit adultery. It's really just lustfulness. Um, that we're not called to look that way upon another person. Um, perjurers has to do with lies, and um, it's not under testimony. This is technically in any form of, of, uh, of, of a conversation. Uh, obviously, lying is not good, but this is a little bit more of a deeper um, idea that, wow, if, if you're somebody who, so essentially there's a trust relationship, and you break that trust because you think that you can manipulate it, um, that's really what they're talking about here, and um, that's probably deeper than we need to know, but lies are bad, so don't do that. Um, now they go into a couple, uh, Malachi goes into a couple of specific kind of relational things. So he says, don't defraud laborers of their wages. Um, and we've seen that a lot in the New Testament, and I think it's really important at this point, because I was actually talking on the phone with somebody today who... Um, we got into a conversation about this specific verse when he's not a Christian or anything. He was trying to argue my, my fees, and I'm like, yeah, like I put in the time, and like this is what we agreed. Like, and he got into we got into this spiritual conversation somehow, and I said, do not def defraud your laborers, man. You hired me to do this. And he's like, isn't that Jewish or something? And I was like, pretty much. And <laughs> but it's there, and it, and it obviously. Um, I, you know, it's kind of interesting. I, I just think that it's really what it is, is it's an honesty thing. That if you're a person that's going to be somebody who's going to, uh, not only if you're going to hire people, give them their wages, but if you just live your life in an honest way and you're a good person, you shouldn't have to worry about this kind of thing. Because um, when you look in the, test, the New Testament about people who've done this, it's usually pretty egregious and they're really taking advantage of people. So um, those who oppress widows and the fatherless, this, um, and this is kind of a Brad thing, I've seen this reference in, in looking at that partic particular scripture that I've seen it reference to people that are in prison. Like that kind of a thing where you have, you have individuals who people, their widows and fatherless, they're not being visited. People aren't loving or, or, or concerning themselves with them and they're kind of lost. Um, we need, you know, that's a bad thing that you would, uh, that you would oppress those individuals, of course, but as we'll learn here, it's actually the opposite of what we're called to do. It's not oppress, it's to love and to do what we can for that specific type of person. So, but this is somebody that God's called out through Malachi. Um, and this, uh, this next one is very interesting, deprive aliens of justice. Um, considering where we're at in today's uh, landscape, depriving aliens of justice literally means what you think it means. Right on the button. And it says that Doing so would create, essentially when you read this and you study it a little bit, it says that the meaning is that, yeah, it's not somebody going to a country so much on their own, it's somebody having no idea where they are on their own. They don't understand the language, they don't understand the laws, and they have no friend, and they have no one there for them. So, and it's through Malachi, this is very specific, deprived aliens of justice. What does that mean? I looked at this and, I'm, and, and the Spirit is telling me justice here means give them a home. It means give them what they, they're humans just like you. The more that we judge them or say, oh, we don't want that, man, that's not good. And whether our political landscape, whatever it looks like, this is the word right here saying, hey, these are specific kind of people that I want you to have a heart for. All right, so deprive, do not deprive aliens of justice. Now there's a catch-all here and it says, and... Basically, all those who do not fear me. 
So <laughs> Malachi is he's he, he's he's saying that there's certain things that we shouldn't be doing, and then also that God hates all those who do not fear Him. Um, which brings me back to Job that I taught on last time, real quick. That the Lord said through Job that um, to fear Me is wisdom, and to shun evil is understanding. And we talked about this two-step process, and the two-step process was number one that we need to fear God. And people were looking for wisdom at that time. And that was a very, that was kind of a source of wealth on us. And what does that mean? Well, wisdom means to fear God. What does fear God mean? We learned through James that James says, do not fear people because, or do not feel your health because they may be able to harm you physically, but they can never harm your, they can never take your soul. But you fear God because God can take your soul and your body into hell forever. Mm -hmm. And so wisdom says, oh my gosh, that's what we're to be concerned with here. And uh, so that's the wisdom and knowledge of that is basically saying, all right, I understand that, so I'm going to shun evil. I'm going to push evil aside. I'm not going to partake in evil. Um, that's, true with, that's true knowledge and wisdom uh, according to Job. And according to God through Malachi, that's basically what he's asking for. Be afraid of me because I'm the one who can take away your soul. And because of that, not only, not only you know, fear me, but shun evil. Because you're never going to be able to live your life the way that I want you to live your life if you partake in these sins that are evil. It's hard to get over and around. I, I struggle with it almost every day. But it's what we're called to do. So it is, um, you know, there's a, what was the scripture you gave me once, Alu, about there's a, every day is a, 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 a new blessing. Oh, yeah. And I don't, yeah, I don't have my phone. Mercy is renewed every morning. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. So that's always some of these. Some of the, what I bring today is going to. Some of it I think is going to be a little like in your face. And so, but we remember that that the mercies are yeah. are new every morning. Um, all right. So, and this is part of it. God essentially God uses Malachi to let us know about a particular source of His anger, and it's really kind of hard to deal with, um, to be honest with you. Uh, if someone could please read uh, Malachi 6 through 9 for me. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O children of Israel, or excuse me, children of Jacob, are not consumed. From the days of your fathers you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? <clears throat> Will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions. If you are cursed with the curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Yeah. That's pretty unsettling. The thought of the fact that by you not giving your tithes, that you're robbing me. That God's saying, man, you're robbing me. Um, part of that, that scripture is fantastic where it says return to me and I'll, and, and I'll return to you. So there's promise in there, but it's also saying, hey guys, you're robbing me. By not giving me what I've called you to give, you're not only not being faithful, you're robbing me. Like, I don't know, it makes me uncomfortable because there's some people in this world, I, I, like, I wouldn't want to rob anybody. <laughs> but think about that. Like God, for God to say, you robbed me, you know, like it's pretty powerful and strong. And, um, and I think that there's a way that we can translate this as we come through, but it started making me think really like, wow, what else am I robbing God, you know, from God? Um, and on that point, there's a specific scripture that I think is pretty telling. Psalm 24, 1, and it's just real fast. It says, um, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. So God's saying that the earth is mine and everything in it is mine. And to me what that means is that if we aren't tithing our 10%, we're not talking about 10% technically. We're talking about the 90% is really the issue. Like there's been, in the Old Testament, there's, and, and, and I'll explain here, but there's, there's these specific, yeah, there's these rules. You're supposed to do this tithing thing. You're supposed to give this amount. But regardless, everything is mine. Everything is mine. So if you're not giving to me your 10%, yeah, that's one thing, but you're also not giving to me your 90% at all. So we're talking about now 100% of being unfaithful and keeping our eyes off of God and specific uh, commandments that he's given. So um, it's pretty heavy stuff. But there's good news, and um, 
and I'll, I'll move away from that here briefly. Um, and the thing is, is that what he was talking about here is definitely applicable to us, but it was also meant for a different time. Um, when we're talking about ties, and I will come back to ties on where we're at today, but ties at that point were very different than what we kind of understand of them. There was a system in place for tithing. There were rules in place for tithing. Um, we won't get into the scripture, but essentially um, the whole system was set up obviously so God could get a ten, his 10%, but also the Levites would take their food from the tithes. So if people weren't tithing, the Levites weren't eating. And that's, uh, the, 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 the scripture is very clear that they were entitled to the best of the, of the, of the animal, the parts of the animal that was sacrificed, the, um, the, the best of the wine, the best of the olive oil, everything. So, but if people stop doing that, wow, we're not feeding God, but you're also not feeding a part of your tribe, um, interestingly enough. So that, there's a very specific reason they talk about tithes um, in this particular scripture. However, I think it's very, very important, considering the whole of Malachi as we talk about this, to keep in mind that this is, again, something that God said, hey, this is something that makes me very, very angry. And um, what that means to me makes me scared. So, I, you know, it's, I say, wow, what does that mean? we got to think about it, and let's talk about it and figure this out. So, we'll move on. Um, so, I think it's very interesting, it's kind of a bridge here. Um, Throughout the, the Old Testament, there are a lot of these scriptures where um, we learn about people in situations, and I did speak about this briefly, but where a lot of the faithful had turned to other things, and they kind of gone. There's, and I won't get into details, but there's so many times we read about, wow, the whole tribe or the whole Isra the Israelites as a whole had become unfaithful, but there were a couple people who remained faithful through that time. Um, and I think of this as being very applicable today as Moses and the, and the Levites. It's just when Moses went up there and he was gone for, was it 40 days? And when he came back down, like all of a sudden everyone got all crazy and they're worshiping golden calves. And he commanded the Levites, because the Levites had been faithful, to go and kill all of the people who had been uh, worshiping the false god. So pretty powerful judgment right there. But those who were faithful and said, I'm not going to partake in that, no way, were spared. Uh, you know, and they actually ended up having the, 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 um, the, 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 the knife in their hand. Um, very interesting twist, but regardless, they were spared. So at that time where most of the people were, had fallen astray in a very short period of time, you've got the Levites who are there, and they were uh, faithful. So the faithful few. Um, I think that uh, the, the way that we need to, to pull this in is, uh, if someone could, could read uh, Malachi 3.16 for me. Appreciate it. Yeah, Jeff. Then those who fell feared the Lord spoke to me, and I Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before him, for those who fear the Lord and who med meditate on his name. Yeah. I love that. So it says that, there's, some, there's people who are afraid that God's not going to know that they weren't fearing him and had the, the, the appropriate level of faith. They're like, I, I don't want to be cast into lots with these other people. So what they do is they go in front of the Lord and it says that in, their, in his presence that they sign a scroll, the book of remembrance, because these people are afraid that, 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 that God's not going to remember that they were good. Um, so, I just love that level of faith that says, man, I've been faithful, like, please don't forget. Well, God says, I'll never forget, right there. So, that's a point to take away from this lesson. God, through the book of remembrance, is promising you that while we're not judged only on our good acts, that your good acts and those services that you do for God, He's not going to forget. He won't forget. Um, there's a book of remembrance. Now, um, someone please read Malachi 3.17 shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, in the day when I make up my treasured possession, and I will spare them as a man spares his son who serves him. Thank you. Um, <coughs> so the passage here is literally saying, like, you'll be my treasured possessions. And um, he's literally saying, you, no matter where I've looked on this, that you're my treasure. 
So God's saying that through your faith that you will, in the end days, be my treasure, my precious treasure, my jewels. You'll be my gold, my silver, uh, and my jewels. And um, the thought of that is, to me, pretty amazing and, uh, and, and kind of hard to fathom. But what God's really saying here is he's saying that, to pull it all together, he's saying, look, I'm going to come back. And when I do, there's going to be a fire, and I'm going to refine you. And when I refine you and break you down, what's going to be left in the whole process of refining is to pull out the good. So God's saying that in the end here, yeah, there's going to be a fire, and there's going to be a shaking, but in the end, what's left is going to be my treasure. So there's some decisions we have to make, I think, about how we're living our lives and going about, and whether we want to be the treasure or not, or, or how we're going to be that treasure that we'll talk about here in a second. But just that thought alone that I could be God's treasure to me is pretty um, mind-blowing. But that's what he says. You're my treasure. You're my precious. So um, that's the book of Malachi. It's very short. And um, uh, some prophecy in there, but there's some very important points that we took away. So, um, But what's interesting now is that we have 400 years between the book of Malachi and Christmas, the birth of Jesus. Um, and during this period, they call it the 400 um, years of silence in Judaism, that essentially God didn't speak to his people for another 400 years. He had all this time in the Old Testament where, wow, they're being led, uh, you know, well, I mean, all these things are going on, and then all of a sudden, it's just silence. And it's a lead up into the birth of Christ. Now, what's interesting is that um, not much changed during this time for for the Jews, frankly. They had an opportunity, really, to look back on the past and say, wow, we made some really big mistakes. We probably should have learned from the fact that God's going to drop manna from the sky, that some amazing things could happen when we have faith and we're, and we're true to him. Well, <laughs> they just kind of kept up with the status quo. And so there were really no changes um, for that type of people in that time period. There were changes in ownership of the land that started out with Persians, they ended up speaking Greek and Hebrew um, th through this time, um, and uh, in the end, Romans had conquered the land that they were living in. Um, but aside from that, the Jews themselves have pretty much stayed the same, until you have uh, somebody born named Jesus, and that changed everything. So can someone please read for me John 1, 9 through 14? John 1, 9 through 14. That was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Hmm. Love that. Amen. Um, wow. So, I don't know, I think it's kind of easy to forget throughout the year, like, really, how important that is. And that scripture right there telling us, like, wow, look at this. Like, there's a birth of a son in God's son that's word. I mean, he's the word on earth, became flesh. And I just love how it says, in glory, 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 as the only son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Like, here he is. It's what the Israelites had been waiting for, for millennia. And, um... I'm not going to get into a discussion about why they didn't recognize Christ as, as, as a, their Messiah. But when you, when you read, and at least in Malachi, there's a lot of hint to it that, that they were waiting for God that was going to come down and raise their nation in front of all nations and say, ha these are my people. And that's what they're looking for. It's really like, we want, to, you know, we want our nation to be risen up above all nations, and that's what God's going to do for us. They weren't expecting a shepherd. They weren't expecting Jesus. This is the last thing on earth they were thinking would be the coming of God. So no matter what he looked like or did, they weren't gonna. He was never gonna be accepted. It's just this is the this is the plan from 
for time. Um, and it's perfect when you think about it. Uh, we, don't, we know where it's going, what's going to happen before, here, and then. Uh, will be interesting to find out as we get to partake. Um, so we have this in the fulfillment of a prophecy. Um, we also have, there's a the scripture here, Galatians 4, 4. It says, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law. So what this is saying is that, wow, okay, number one, like we, you, God, of the, God has come down incarnate in flesh. But also what the law was is no longer the law. You have, God's come down and taken essentially, I've taken myself, and we'll talk about this in a, in a second, but now I'm the law. Um, and that Jesus Christ himself has really washed away what that, the law was, and it's the rudimentaryism of the old, law, the old scripture, and he's saying, now I need you to have faith in me, and I need you to have love and heart. And it also has a lot to do with what we look at in terms of tithing as well. So, um, but just keep in mind there that also, Jesus never says that the law is completely, and so I guess, he never says it's wiped away completely. He says that I've come to fulfill it. That I've come to fulfill what the what the what these the prophecies and the laws were, what they were for. So where he fills that prophecy or that law, it kind of you know the logic says, well, then that means that whatever was there before would fall away. But it's not like everything tithing. It doesn't mean that all right, we don't have tithe now. It's like people say, if I believe in Jesus, is that enough? Just if, you know, there's a thought out there. Well, you're saved by faith and faith alone. If you have faith, you can go on living your life in whatever way you see fit. And you're saved, so you're going to be in heaven with God, right? And when you get into the Word and you start looking closer, that's not what the Word says. Part of it is, yeah, you, you need to believe in me, but then there's that next step that, unfortunately, I think that a lot of people don't take in their lives. Um, it's number one, yeah, all right, I believe, but then God says, now you obey me. <laughs> and now you listen to my words, and you, and you follow what I've, the commandments that I've given you, and you give your heart and your life to me, and, you can, and I will have you for eternity. But that, that next step, I think that um, it's kind of like your, your testimony tonight. There's a lot of people that are in faith, but they're not. And it's just, uh, oh, oh, oh. I go to church on Sunday and I give my 10%. And God's saying, that's not what I want. The money doesn't mean anything to me. I want your heart. I want your life. And until we do that, I mean, before, I think it's just a testament to what the Old Testament, the people in this time really thought of God. It's very rudimentary. We do this, we do this, we don't do this. Da, 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 da. And now it's this whole like, oh, you know, I think of hallelujah, but also it's love. It's like you can almost taste it and feel it. That's what it is. Is the love come on earth, come down on earth, and just it permeates everything that we we do now. So we're, I mean, think about that. You had all these people. I was going to get get into Hebrews 11, and I'm not going to have time. But there's a scripture in Hebrews 11 that talks about all these great men and women of the Bible, frankly, um, of the Old Testament. And they say all these people had done these. They had extreme faith. They had amazing faith. They were a faithful few, time and time and time again. But none of them had what was promised to them. And only through me will they have, will they be full, essentially, depending on the scripture. And what they're saying is that none of them had Christ. They were waiting for something. They were promised a new land. And they could see it, but they never were able to taste it. And so what they had was part of the whole. They'd been given a word and a promise, but they didn't have the actual results. And so we're living in a time now, I mean, think about that. Like, you have, like, Abraham and Moses were saying, man, God, I, I want to be with you and live in a life that has you with it. They didn't have the Holy Spirit. All they had, I mean, they had a God yelling, you know, above them. Like, that's terrifying. And, um, and we have a God that loves us and is in us. So, I mean, we're literally living a life that they would want to have lived and they were, were looking for. Um, and, I don't know, it's easy to forget that, but don't. I think that, you know, our lives are not the same as the lives that we're reading about in the Old Testament. We've been giving a lot more. We've been giving a lot more. There's a lot of responsibility that goes along with that. So, um, back into the Word. Let's cite us into Malachi. Um, so, Malachi 3.1 says that there's going to be a messenger. Um, and if someone could read Matthew 3.11 for me, I'd appreciate it.
I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Mm -hmm. So, Malachi says there's going to be a messenger, and that messenger is going to come uh, before I do, and then your great God is going to come down and be amongst you. So that's what Malachi 3, 1 says. Malachi 3, 2 through 3 talks about there being a, a refining of fire, and it says that yeah, when I come, there's going to be judgment, and there's going to be fire, and... <laughs> Sure enough, you read Matthew, and I, somehow I, I miss this throughout the years. I always only think of, yeah, I know that, you know, when Jesus comes and it says in Matthew, and John the Baptist said, that we'll be, we'll be baptized in the Holy Spirit. But it says the Holy Spirit and fire. Like, and fire. When you read and go back through the Old Testament, time and time and time again, when they talk about God coming, it's fire, 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 fire. fire. What does that mean? You know, um, I think it means a lot, and uh, there's, there's obviously it means a lot. But the fact that it's right there and it keeps coming up that there's going to be a fire is undeniable. That when there's a time that we're going to be with Jesus and there's a judgment that's coming because it's coming because it's been told we've been told that we can't sit here like the Jews and just say ah well it's you know it's it's all it not anything to do with the whole but. Man, like you had a lot of chances, and you just didn't get it. And now, you know, we've been given these stories, and it's saying, hey, like, fire's coming, and I'm going to judge you. What are you going to do with your life? Is really what this is saying in the end. Yeah, we've got, number one, we've got salvation, which is phenomenal. But also, what are you going to do with your life? You've been given a short period of time down here. So, when I refine you, how much refining am I going to have to do? You know, um, we have a faithful few that are here among us, um, but the word is just that, it's just that, man, like, there's judgment coming, and it's not that we need to be, I think that the idea is technically, we don't need to be afraid of that judgment, or we shouldn't be afraid of that judgment, it's kind of like walking into the, something that you're expecting your whole life, and you just, we're going to go through it, because that's something that we need to know is coming, regardless, so, but live your life in a way that you're knowing at one time there's going to be judgment, so then I don't want to do things that, during that time, I'm going to have to look back and be ashamed of, essentially, mm -hmm. because you're going to look back and you're going to have next to Jesus while you're in fire being refined, however that works, and you're going to have to count for these days. Uh, and it's very much <laughs> uh, 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 beyond just some kind of a prophecy um, as you read through the good word. So, um, all right, moving on. Um, in Malachi 3, 2 through 3, you talk about this, and, and um, he also, so not only is it you're going to be baptized by a fire, but it's important to note here that he references specifically the Levites. And he says the Levites are going to be refined by fire, and they're going to come out essentially as silver and gold. And I really, I thought about that for a while. Like, what does this mean? And like, why is, the, yeah, the Levites are part of all this, but why is this such a big kind of influence here. Um, and the answer is, frankly, people like, we are the Levites. The Levites of this time, they were a people that, that were told that God was, was going to be your inheritance. So you had responsibility because God was going to be your inheritance. And that responsibility was to take care of the temple. And that responsibility was to give your offerings to me. But Ultimately, all they were were a people who were promised something, and what they were promised was God. They were promised that God would be their treasure, and Jesus came down for us. And so we're living as a people, if we choose to believe them, I think that when I read these, these scriptures, that we're all the Levites, that that's what we're here for, technically, um, part of it, at least, that we are... We're just that next kind of carrying over of, of, of what all that means. I, to me, it's just amazing to think of it this way. So, um, Peter 9, uh, sorry, uh, 1 Peter 2, 9 through 10 says that, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. So, when I read this, putting this together... Malachi is really a prophecy for us. 
if we're to consider ourselves Levites and, uh, and to think of ourselves in that same way, yeah, there was the Levites as a nation and there were the, there, there were the priesthood, who was kind of a different sect of the Levites, but it's still, there's very much a tie-in to what Malachi is saying and how we're living our lives today. We talk about a refiner's fire and specific things that, um, that God appreciates and God uh, is uh, concerned with. And so let's get into the, the one that, that's probably on your mind because it was on mine the whole time, the tithing issue. Um, this is just the fact that Malachi talked about robbing from God to me was, was very impactful. And so um, I did a lot of, of thinking about this and, and meditation. Um, and um, interestingly, the New Testament really never calls us to tithe. It, there's just the references to tithing are tithing in uh, are, are, are really the, the, the Pharisees who are saying that they're tithing, so therefore they're righteous. Um, so I found that very interesting, but it also doesn't mean that we're not called to tithe. So <laughs> it's not an excuse not to tithe, but it, but there, the New Testament doesn't ever reference it. Um, what it references over and over and over is giving, and that we are to give ourselves for each other. That we're to give ourselves for the poor. We're to give ourselves for the last of them. Um, if someone could read for me, I don't have it here. Two, Second Corinthians. Uh, Nine, six through nine. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly also reaps sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Amen. Could you read while you're there, verse 11 for me too? Absolutely. You will be made rich in every way, so that you can be generous on every occasion. Mm -hmm. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that. So, now we have a new manner of why we would be giving thanks and why we would be praising God. Before it was, well, this is part of the law, this is part of what we're called to do. Now it's that, well, God's among us, and Emmanuel. He's come down. Now. He is part of us now. So through that, we are called to be a people who are generous. God's given everything for us, and we need to, we are called, frankly, to be uh, thinking of others before we're thinking of, our, of ourselves, um, and to live a life as Jesus would have walked. So um, I think what's most important to think of is that we're called to be living sacrifices. And, um, again, I don't have it in front of me. I was going to flip, but if someone could read Romans 12, uh, 1, I'd appreciate it. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Uh, that. So this is our spiritual act of worship and of tithing at this point, to sacrifice ourselves. Um, and, and, you know, I really pondered on this, and I, and I think that this means a lot more than, than just on its surface. Like, yeah, okay, if we're called to tithe, and we're also called to be living sacrifices, that God's the one who's going to tell us what it is exactly that your tithe needs to be. And part of this may be we're get to give our time. We're to give our hearts, we're to give our spirit to other people, and we're to be a light. And tithing to us, yeah, there's a monetary aspect, but like I said before, God's calling us 100%. He owns everything that we are and that we, uh, everything that we, we, we encompass as God's. And so he wants all of that. He wants all of us. And we know that, but we need to be able and, and, and ready to give to others what he's given to us. And um, that can be hard to do, especially around times where a lot of people are asking for things. But just keep in mind, I think, that, that God you know, has said that your life is not yours. That this is his life, and he, you know, hopefully we're not getting in the way and we're allowing him to, uh, to, to, to live through us. So, um, in conclusion, I've got one more passage that, um, actually, I'll read. I'll flip to it real quick. And... Uh, this is really, I think, in the end, exactly what we're talking about. Okay. 
Matthew 25, 31 through 40. Getting old, man. First time I've ever had to do that. Um, okay, so you have. Um, All right, so this is a, a, a interesting, it's a parable here, and you have Jesus talking to uh, Pharisees, and he says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will gather before him, and he will separate the people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on the right, Come, you are blessed. By, the, by my Father. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the crea creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the, righteousness, then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see, hung see you hungry, and feed you, or thirsty, and give you something to drink? When do we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When do we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Pretty impactful. That's amazing. Oh, I love that. Whatever you did for one of the... It's not even... You know, and, and just in closing, um, we're at a time right now in this year where we need to be, I think, you know, very cognizant of the fact that we have salvation and really what that means. Um, that scripture right there in terms of like, you know, what we could do to offer back is to me really what it's all about. God says that it's about the last of us. What does that mean? It's just that. You fed me. You, cl you clothed me. Whatever we can do for people, if our heart and our mind is on that, being givers, that um, I think that our works are going to be glorified through God. So appreciate you guys listening to me through my long sermon tonight, and I hope that we're able to take something from you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, that was fantastic. That was great. Thank you, Tobias. Mm -hmm. It's always better when you speak from the heart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, you just throw the notes away and just speak. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, that's great. God is good. Uh, all the words you shared were very, um, uh, these are words that people have, some of the things you shared, people have been contemplating that. Some even have arguments against some of the things you said, but uh, uh, just so you know, I'm on your side on the mm -hmm. things that you said. But I know the other arguments on the other side, but I am actually on your side uh, uh, as it relates to uh, tithing and giving and the general spirit. And uh, the Spirit of the Lord led you to tie it all together, and that's great. Mm -hmm. uh, what we are to do is to be generous. Uh, we're not supposed to be mechanical mm -hmm. and say, oh yeah, you know, we're supposed to give 10% and strict 10%. In mm -hmm. fact, as you said, uh, the earth, everything belongs to the Lord. Mm -hmm. uh, the rich man wasn't asked to give 10%, he was asked to give everything. Mm -hmm. And yet he said, oh no, I can't do that. And the Lord said, well, you're not worthy of me then if you, if you can't give it all. There are times that the Lord will test you not in 10% and say, give everything. Uh, in fact, it's interesting you talked about that today because I was just speaking to a, my sister having the same conversation. And uh, she was said, there was a time, uh, real quick, I know we're about to go, but I think it's a reason why I was talking to her today and you were bringing this up. I was talking to my older sister today. And she said, uh, there was a time I was in university. I didn't have a lot of money and I just got a little bit of money. And she said that I heard very clearly when I got that money that the Holy Spirit said, go and give it to this person. And at first she says, can that be possible? Because I need this money. And the Holy Spirit didn't say give some of it, give all of it. And she was like, what? And she goes, you know what? I said, well, didn't you have a choice? She goes, you don't understand. The hand of God was so heavy on me, I didn't have, I said, hmm, what happened to people that say they have free will? I said, I don't, she said, I don't know what they're thinking, but the hand of God was so heavy on me, and, and the Lord said to give everything. 
And so she went and she went to this lady and she said, well, you know, the Lord said I should give you this. And guess what the lady said? Oh, so you're the one. Thank God. Mm -hmm. You're the one? Mm -hmm. You who? Well, unknown to her, the lady had been praying. She was destitute. Mm -hmm. And the Lord had said that somebody, we did it. she didn't say, oh, my sister. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Somebody is going to come. Mm -hmm. And so the lady said, oh, praise the Lord. You're the one. Mm -hmm. What happened? My sister didn't give because, oh, uh, you know, I'm going to get so much back. She said, I didn't even think about that until much later. And I began to see the hand of the Lord open some doors for me that I had forgotten many years. This happened like a couple of years later. She began to see some miraculous things that the Lord did for her. And it finally clicked. Oh, wow. Could it have been that it was due to that obedience? I said, it's interesting. What if you hadn't obeyed? What if you had been mechanical in your relationship with the Lord and said, oh, no, I'm not supposed to give everything. Especially when I need something, but the Lord tests all of us. And it's interesting you brought this message on tithing and giving and generous heart. Because sometimes the Lord will ask, give it all. Sometimes the Lord will say, give small. Sometimes the Lord will say, give nothing. It's a relationship. It's not a business relationship. It's a personal relationship. So thank you for bringing that. I think that was really important. And uh, uh, God bless you. Well, that's good. That's great. Um, let's arise and, and share a word in, in prayer. That was awesome. Yes.